without further ado, we'll get on to um, the subject tonight, which is talking mostly about Velo City, with a little bit about Walk 21. And I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker, who is Damien Otuma. Damien Otuma is, um, is the National Cycling Coordinator. He's been in this role for nine years. And this, this role works between Antarctica and the National Douglas uh, Cyclist.ie body, which has been restructured. Damien's also a member of the Dublin Cycling Campaign Exec Committee. Damien has also, for five years, he's just stepped down, been a board member of the European Cyclist Federation. So as you can see, Damien is incredibly busy, a credit productive person who's been doing a huge amount. Um, um, and Damien is now going to tell us about Velo City, um, what Velo City is and um, what he went to see in Velo City this year. Hand over to you there, Damien. Ellen, thanks for the very kind introduction and thanks to Siobhan for all the organising. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay, very good. Um, just going to kick off the few words and then have a couple of photographs to show after a few minutes. But I wanted to go back in time a little bit, back to the year 2000, which was the first time I had the opportunity of going to Velo City. And it was in Amsterdam and it was in the middle of a hot summer. And it was also the summer that the Euro 2000s were being held in Amsterdam. So it was an absolutely amazing atmosphere over there. The city was packed with bicycles, packed with campaigners. Uh, packed with fo football fans, and it was just a, a kind of raucous energy, bril a brilliant atmosphere over there, and the conference itself was the first time I'd been, I'd been at a giant cycling campaign and conference. So it really made a huge impression on me, I think because I was struck by how serious all of the officials were and all of the campaigners about making cities bicycle friendly, and it wasn't just a small number of advocates, it was everybody there, it was the politicians, the officials, academics, bike industry, and it really made a huge impression on me. It, it, um, I think I got the bug at that point. Uh, the city itself was also amazing. You know, there was Rasta heads, there was suits, there was mothers with children on bikes, there was fathers always going around on bikes. So the, the cycling culture was very inclusive. So I think when I went there, I, I really, it, it really, I think, um, shifted the direction of, of, of my career and everything else. And I've been going to Vela City since. The Dublin Cycling Campaign had gone to Velo City in, um, throughout the 1990s in Barcelona, in, uh, in Moribor, in Slovenia. And even Kieran Byrne from the Square Wheel had represented Dublin Cycling Campaign in England. It was either in the 80s or 90s. I need to, I need to check in with them on that. So, so at this stage, Velo City, it's been around for 40 years. It kicked off in Bremen in, in Germany in 1980. And really, it's, it's, it's turned into the, the kind of largest gathering of experts on cycling, the advocates, the, the academics, the officials, the politicians, the bike industry. It's exchanging information. It's re, it's, it's re enthusing each other. You know, for a long time, there was a very small number of advocates working hard to change the city. And really, when you went abroad, met your counterparts, they kind of reaffirmed your, your uh, commitment to, to what you were doing. And that, that, that's really important when you're, when you're working in a kind of small area. Um, so I have a couple of slides that I'm just going to flick on here to pick out uh, a few highlights. So just bear with me now and hopefully this will come up okay. Everyone can see that okay? Yeah. Um, so look, just the first slide, I mean, the first thing to say about Ljubljana in Slovenia, it's a very beautiful city. And on the night, the night before the conference started, the European Cyclist Federation uh, brought together all of the campaigners for, you know, a night of just, just the campaigners getting together. Um, we met on, uh, it's, it's an old skyscraper in the city centre, and we had a reception on the roof. And from the roof, you can see um, the, the, the castle and the city. So it's, so it's a magnificent city. And if anyone has a chance uh, to go there, I'd, I'd definitely recommend it. Um, this is just a screenshot from a, a YouTube video that's on the European Cyclist Federation website. It shows all of the different locations that Velo City uh, has taken place in since, since 1980. And um, I think some of you, a lot of you are aware that Velo City, is, it, it, it came to Dublin way back in 2005. And there's an interesting little video up on YouTube. It's called Perils for Pedestrians, Dublin. Uh, Velo City 2005, and it's a, it's about 25, 30 minutes long, and it's a nice little snapshot of transport planning in Dublin in 2005, some of the personalities involved, some of the, the thinking, and um, it, it's worth checking out, and for, for a long time, 
things were moving along incredibly slowly in Dublin. And really in the last few years between COVID, between the new government and the confluence of different factors, it's moved on quite quickly. And I have an image here when Velo City came back in 2019 and we had a great number of advocates attending, huge number of Irish officials. And within the cycling campaigning circles, we made a huge effort to make sure that all the different local authorities sent people along. And I think we're now enjoying some of the positive ripple effects from all of the, the attendees of that. So then bouncing along to, uh, to Ljubljana, and I've just three, three points I'm going to pick out. And the first point, it was, it, I, I just really enjoyed meeting the cycling campaigners from Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Kosovo. We, we've met a lot of the campaigners maybe from the Northern European countries over the years, but it was really getting an insight into their challenges. And actually their challenges are very similar to our own excessive prioritization given to moving moving cars in cities and you know the struggle to wrestle space away for bikes in these places and maybe the example that jumped out to me most of all in a, in a particular session on that topic was Radu from Romania talking about the extreme difficulties of normalizing everyday cycling in Romania and there's a total ban uh, for anyone under 14 to cycle in Romania, including bike tracks, bike lanes, um, even if accompanied by adults. So they're really up against it there. Even to exist as an NGO is a huge struggle. Uh, the legislation makes it nearly impossible to have members. So I, I used to think we were down in, in the very bottom bottom part of the, the ladder for cycle campaigning organizations, but hearing some of the examples from, from Eastern Europe, I, I, it made us feel that we're, we're kind of closer to the middle. Um, one of the big positives of Ljubljana was, um, I suppose, the, the diversity. A lot of the CEOs of the biggest cycling organizations are women. Uh, that's Sarah Mitchell from Cycling UK, and uh, she's the new the new CEO. And also in the picture there, we have uh, uh, Katarina. She's the CEO of ADFC, the German uh, cycling advocacy organization. And we have Jill Warren, who's the CEO of the European Cyclist Federation. And also, uh, it was chaired by the former uh, CEO of the Dutch Cyclist Union, who's now a senator in the Dutch Parliament. So there's greater diversity than there was certainly 20 years ago. And I think that's good for advocacy and good for cycling. And Cyclist.ie, we have a meeting now at Cycling UK tomorrow, following on really from, from the, the networking we did at, at Velo City. So my final point is um, I present myself in Ljubljana on, on um uh, I suppose the funding success we had in Ireland as a result of good ad advocacy over the last few years, advocacy to 20% of the transport pie allocated for cycling. It was part of a wider session on funding for cycling. Um, we received a lot, of, I suppose, a lot, of, a lot of questions, a lot of positive encouragement. And, uh, you know, we would like to see that every single country in Europe allocates 20% of its transport pie for, for walking and cycling, not just in Ireland. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to go through the presentation, but just to show one of the slides I showed as part of the campaign on this, uh, we did a lot of leafleting. We had protests in the streets. This is a picture of Mairead and myself giving out leaflets on the canal a few years ago. And there was a wider social media campaign. You know, we, we looked to shape political manifestos ahead of the election. So I think it was an example of a good campaign and um, the ultimate outcome. Now there was different forces influencing this, of course, but ultimately was shaping the program for government. So that was just a snapshot of that presentation. And I have the whole one up on, um, I have an article up on the website of cyclist.e where you can see the full presentation and some further reflections on the conference. So I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I'm going to, I'm going to more or less wrap it up there and I'm happy to answer any questions, but overall a very positive event. And I'd encourage anyone to, if you have a chance again. So thanks a million. And I hope I haven't run over time. Thanks, David. No, you haven't run over time. That's great. Thanks, Amelia. I said, and we'll do questions. We'll get all the speakers to talk and then we'll just do questions in one go at the end, if that's okay. So that, that way everyone can get a chance to speak. Okay. Thanks, Amelia, Damien. That was really interesting. Um, next up is Joe Sachs Eldridge. Joe is the founder of the Leitrim Cycling Festival and Joe is also um, a member of the executive of Cyclist.ie and Joe's going to talk about um, something about Bella City as well. Over to you, Joe. Joe, you're on mute.
Can you hear me now? Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <coughs> um, as Helen said, I'm Jo Sachs-Eldridge, um, and my report kind of covers a few different themes that were of interest to me. So they're not necessarily a summary of any particular session, but kind of a pulling together of different ideas and insights from speakers and from presentations and from different conversations I had during the five days. But then um, after I put my slides together, I realized there was no way I was going to cover all of this in eight minutes. So I'm just going to give you a really brief summary of just bits of it. So when I went to Velo City, there were two things in particular that I wanted to learn. And the first one was what's happening in other rural areas across the globe. So I went to any of the sessions on rural solutions, including the cargo bike session, which covered um, e-bike adoption schemes like the one in rural Austria. And during the breaks, I also sought out people to kind of pick their brains. So people from Slovenia and Austria and Denmark and the Netherlands and the UK to find out whether they had similar roads to our rural roads and what solutions they had found. And what I found was that while we might be able to do something like this two minus one design on some of our widest regional roads, and this is what they're doing in, in Sweden and Denmark, it appears that most of our rural roads are narrower and more lightly trafficked. So it, we've got our own challenges, but we've also possibly got our own opportunities. I also managed to track down people from TII and the department to talk to them about this rural roads idea. And we're still waiting on the results of this. TII study on quiet roads, but hopefully we'll be seeing trials happening in the near future. And in relation to e-bikes, an interesting study was published recently showing that e-bikes really are a silver bullet in terms of reducing car use, reducing emissions and providing a form of exercise. And these final links are just um, a couple of bike libraries that have popped up recently, which, um, and I'd love to see more of these happening all over Ireland, particularly in rural areas. Um, oh, and the last thing is that we're working on a paper at the moment on the removal of all the unnecessary AT signs. Um, so this might happen kind of in conjunction with the Roha Roads, but also separate to the Roha Roads. So keep your eyes on that. So um, the next thing that I was particularly interested in was um, route assessment. So for the last year or so, a group of us have been developing the cycle route assessment checklist with the aim of raising standards and enabling more diverse voices to be heard in the design of cycle routes. And what I learned in Velo City was A, that route assessments are really important if we want good quality routes, but also that other countries, particularly places like Denmark, are starting to look beyond the five needs of cyclists and putting greater value on things like the flow and the splendor of a route and where you can stop for lunch and where's the nice view. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to seeing whether we can incorporate some of these ideas into Crack as we develop it more. Um, the links I've put up there are where you can find out more about Crack and also the link to um, a recent nationwide episode which featured Crack. Uh, and if anybody would like to join the Crack team, please do get in touch because we need a little boost of energy at the moment. So tourism was a really interesting one for me because prior to Bella City, I had zero interest in tourism. But following a series of sessions and really interesting conversations with different people from different countries, I was in the end convinced that actually cycle tourism has a huge role to play in the shift to active travel. So according to the United Nations World Tourism Organization, um, the three trends in uh, tourism are domestic, sustainable and active travel. And cycling, of course, ticks all of those. But of course, as well, it needs to be done well. So it needs to be designed primarily for locals. We also need to look beyond just the routes and look at all of the supports surrounding the tourism decisions like cafes and bike rental and charging points and trains that allow you to take your bike. And we need to get really good at telling good stories about our routes. And finally, we need to aim our tourist packages at women who are the main holiday decision makers. I'm listing Gort cycle trails here because Kathleen is starting to tell some good stories about routes in Gort. And also the Danube network, 
um, because this might be something worth aspiring to with the Shannon master plan, because the Danube route, it's of course along a river, but it's more than just a linear route because each country that it passed through was required to develop a cycle network linking to the river route, making it of course more valuable to locals and as well as tourists. Now for some reason it keeps going the wrong way. So this was also really interesting, this idea of being provocative and, and how we use our language. And during lots of the sessions, lots of questions were raised about pushing boundaries, using hard facts about death, being conflictual rather than collaborative. And of course, no answers were given, but it's a really good reminder of how much language matters and the need to ensure that the voices of the silent majority are being heard. <clears throat> and it was interesting as well, some advocates talked about how they had helped prepare their councillors or elected representatives for bike clash, as they called it, which I think is something we possibly need to do more of here. Um, and also, like Ellen mentioned, we are restructuring and rebranding. And I think it's really important that we think about the language that we use to do that and how we want to position ourselves. And separate to that, we've also started to have conversation about provocatively creating a vision for women or caregivers as our next in initiative in recognition of the key role they play in, in the modal shift. Um, I probably don't have very much time left, but just to say we need to get really good at telling stories about what life is like in our cities and in our rural areas. We also need to work together on this, all of this, and have fun doing it. And so if you haven't yet, please join one of the cyclist.ie action groups because there's lots of fun to be had there. Um, and also do go to Velo City if you can. So that is me. So huge thanks for listening and for giving me the opportunity to go to Velo City. Um, similar to Damien, I kind of, I had already caught the bug, but it's, it's reignited that bug in me. Um, and I hope it also will be um, kind of life changing for my little lady who will have experienced what a car free city looks like now and she'll have ideas about what the future could look like. So yeah, huge thanks. And then my very last thing is to recommend that everybody reads this book. I think it's amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Joe. I actually came in under time. <laughs> You're flying. I know because it's really hard to gauge it right because if you go into detail, there's so much to talk. I love the way you parceled it into kind of different kind of themes or messages you got out of it. And I particularly liked the bit about uh, women and caregivers. I think that's a huge growth area in cycling. That's one of the crunch points where people buy a car, I think, is when they have children and they feel that they need to ha have a car to ferry the kids around. And as a mother of four children, I know that's not true. And I think that's a a real growth area. Thanks a yeah. Okay. Sorry about telling. It is absolutely, absolutely. It's, 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 like you said, women make a lot of decisions about the, how, th what things are bought and things like that thing. Okay. Well, I'm up next, um, talking about, um, Walk 21. Walk 21 was a four day conference and was a five day really, but four, four days that I attended and I have eight minutes to talk about it. So I'm going to at best hit this in spots. So um, bear with me. I'll, I'll give you some of the highlights, tell you a bit about it, but I'm obviously there's loads more. Just as you, at the end, I'll put in a link. A lot of the sessions from, um, so I've got a, a child having their dinner here in the background. Um, a lot of the sessions are recorded um, and up on the site. So I'll put the link into the chat. So that's why I was saying at the beginning, it's really worth, there's some loads of great links up in the chat here already. It's really worth saving the chat at the end and going back over those links. So, okay, a little bit about Walk 21. Walk 21 isn't a conference for 2021. It's called, the organization is called Walk 21. And it's a global charity leading the walking movement. So this was a, a global conference held in Ireland. So it was a big deal. It was a real honour to have here. And a, a real kudos to Lorraine Fitzsimons and Darcy for bringing it to Ireland. And she did a fantastic job. It was a fat, beautiful conference, really well run, really friendly, very collaborative. One of the loveliest conferences I've ever been to. Um, the theme of the conference was Decade for Change. And one of the things we had talked about is that People have been talking about change in the past, but the change really has to happen now with climate change, with road deaths, 
with our, how our cities are growing, we really have to make these change happen. So there's a sense of urgency to the conference. And I'll quickly let you know the um, structure and why I can only give you give you kind of little kind of tidbits of what happened. Basically, there was a, a youth conference on Monday, which was fabulous. A collaboration, all these young people telling telling um, facilitator what they liked about um, the, the city, how they liked moving around, what was good, what was bad. There was a real range of ages. There's primary school kids right up to kind of university age kids, and they had it was a beautiful collaboration. Um, and then the other days there was a plenary session in the morning followed by up to seven different breakout sessions and it was a real feeling of FOMO like I want to go to all of them they were all fabulous so you had this constant feeling all these gorgeous talks you wanted to go to so plenary session breakout breakout sessions in the morning plenary session breakout session in the afternoon that was that was Tuesday and Wednesday and then on Thursday it was kind of round tables um, a world cafe and a plenary session at the end so you can see there was a huge amount I, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover it all but hopefully I'll give you a taste of what it was like so um Sorry, there's a very noisy child now we're eating their dinner behind me. Great. Um, okay, on the um sorry, I've got it here. Sorry, there's just so many. Okay, one of the sessions that really stood out to me was the Swiss team. I can't find the name of the speaker now looking back. A Swiss team who were trying to work out how to create safe routes to schools for children. And rather than talking to adults, they went straight to the kids and they got the children to draw a picture, two pictures, a picture of what was good about their route to school and what was bad about their route to school. And they got the kids to draw the pictures in school without any input from their parents. They didn't want any interference from adults in the children's perception of their route to school. And then they got a team, including engineers, psychologists, architects, a multidisciplinary team to basically analyze the drawings and uh, drawings and work out what the kids were saying about their routes to school. Um, I thought it was an, an amazing initiative. And at the end of it, they, they drew a load of conclusions. And what was interesting was they gave, they drew a set of conclusions for decision makers, for um, planners and local authorities. They also drew together a um, list of um, initiatives or whatever for parents and things. And one of the one of the things they said was give your children more freedom. Don't cost your children, let your children experience the environment because they don't learn how to deal with danger unless they um, are exposed to a little bit of danger. I thought it was very interesting. It, it wasn't just the local authorities and the professionals we're talking to. On Tuesday, there was a talk by Dr. Lake Segreas from Pontifica Universidad Catholic de Chile. I found this an absolutely mind-blowing talk. It was just incredible. And I really, if it's up on the sessions, I really recommend listening to it. But in Chile, only 9% of people drive. Only 9% of people have cars. Car ownership is way down on what we have. And yet their road deaths are something like a magnitude of 10 higher than us. That this small minority of people are literally killing hundreds and hundreds of people every year. And this is all over the world. Like a speaker from Vietnam said two and a half thousand children a year in Vietnam are killed on their roads. Okay, it's a population of 70 million, but two and a half thousand children in Vietnam are killed on the roads every year. And again, this is a country with a very low car ownership. So a small number of people are wiping out a huge number of pedestrians and it was, it was a very very emotional um speech and also she talked about how we think of measures pedestrianizing the measures we bring in terms of western countries but she talked about how the same measures can have very different effects for good and for bad in developing countries she gave an example of they brought they brought in a pedestrianized route and they narrowed a road and it slowed drive-by shootings i had never thought about things like that in areas of higher higher and um, violence how the same measures can have different effects um, in different parts of the world again I'd highly recommend looking at um, her talk online um, another um, speaker was Helga Hilhunter um, from Norway I'm not sure if his talk is up but he talked about the interaction between walking and public transport and how if your walking infrastructure does isn't good your public transport us usership won't go up no matter how good it is. And apparently the average person, the average public transport user, half of their journey is walking. Again, this is applicable to cycling as well, obviously. So a cycling or walking routes to public transport is really important. And so apparently like for a bus route about uh, people will walk less because the bus is slower. And for a train route, people will walk further to get to a faster train. But they've done studies in parts of the world. And once you install good walking and cycling infrastructure linking to public transport, Public transport usage goes up by three. So it was really brought home that there's no point in installing a state-of-the-art public transport system if you don't cater for people who are walking and cycling as well. 
Um, on Wednesday, there was a very, very emotional and moving um, spe speech by Professor Charles Brown. And the title, his organization is called Arrested Mobility. And he basically layered up how people and minorities, he, he was talking about the United States and, if I, I, and I talked to him afterwards, if I had any criticism of the talk, I would say that it was so stark, he would go, oh, that's America, that doesn't apply here. But he literally layered up how when people of colour go out and walk, they're attacked, they're policed, by, they're arrested, they're policed when they jog. And he, he listed Trayvon Martin and these, these young men and young women who are killed on the street for jogging. And then he talked about when they cycle, you're attacked and in your car you're attacked and he just it was almost claustrophobic he described how these people when the minorities mobility is literally shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and it's all very well to say oh get in get onto your bike or go for a walk a lot of these a lot of people and minorities or people of color just don't have that choice it is too dangerous for them it was a really powerful shocking moving presentation and i'd highly recommend um you can feel emotion now highly recommend um watching it and then <laughs> another very moving um, was Nasa Hurrigan and her daughter, Edith. Edith is blind and she has dyspraxia. And she was so funny and vibrant. She was a fabulous child. And she talked about how, sorry for getting so emotional. She talked about how she was first introduced to a beautiful garden in um, Child Vision. And the garden was full of flowers and butterflies and, um, and birds. And she had her freedom for the first time. And then she was... Um, released out onto the streets of Dublin <clears throat> and she's met with um, bins and signs and parked cars and apparently he, she's even had people physically push her to one side and that, that, I found that really shocking and again I highly recommend her talk and the oh the um, the organizer asked her what what message do you have for people and she said just show me that you care show me that you care in the environment, show you that you care about my needs. So again, a very moving, powerful talk, highly recommend it. And on the same team, Rowena, and I can't remember her surname, sorry, she's a wheel, wheelchair cyclist in the UK. And she talked about how so wheelchair users, wheelchair cyclists and cyclists have a lot in common. And we should club together for um, shared causes. She obviously felt very strongly about kissing gates and styles and mobility. And she talked about how a person with a disability can't spontaneously go out, go out for a ride on their you know, for a hand cycle or go out. They have to plan their route because of obstacles and that we need to gather information and share information and make it so that people with disabilities can have the same level of freedom that the rest of us do. Again, really powerful talk. I highly recommend it. And she also said she's actually had people say to her on Pats, get out of my way. So a bit like with them. Um, NASA's daughter, just this complete disregard for people with disabilities. If there was to be a theme for Walk 21, I would say there's kind of three big th themes. One was if you build environments that are suitable for children, for elderly people, for pe people with disabilities, you're building good places for everyone. That applies to walking and cycling. I mean, there was the conference is very much about walking and very much kind of don't mention cycling, but there was huge overlaps. If you build somewhere that's good for children, for people with disabilities, for women, you're building places that are good for everyone. A second theme that came up over and over again is the theme of shortcuts, that everyone likes or needs shortcuts. So an elderly person going for a walk, if they get tired, they need, a, they need to be able to take a shortcut home. A child can like a shortcut to make it feel like a mystery or a world that other people don't have. And also the idea that when you have a route, you have more than one option. So let's say you meet, you're going along a street and you see somebody who's intimidating. You have another option. You have another way to get your destination, that there's not only one way to get somewhere. And the last thing that actually came up over and over again was benches and how benches make urban, urban spaces hospitable. How important benches are for people to gather, for people to rest, for people to come together. And there was one talk that was just dedicated to, bench, to benches, and I hope it's up on the list. But she talked about how people aren't asked what benches they want, and the bench that a teenager wants isn't the same as a bench an old person wants. An old person needs a back and hand and rails. A teenager might want to sit sideways and face somebody, all these different benches. But she says nobody's ever asked. And when they did ask, people said they don't want benches that are cold, and they don't want benches that are grey or black. And she pointed out the vast majority of benches in our cities are metal, and concrete and they're black or grey. Um, again, I'll pop up the link in a while. That's just a quick flavour of um, Walk 21. It was a fabulous conference. 
I'd highly recommend going if you ever get a chance. Um, it was emotional, uplifting, moving, and um, if you get a chance, do read over or do watch some of the presentations online. I'll pop the link up now. Okay, I'm sorry for getting emotional, but if you've been there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. We were all so we were all so so upset. Okay, I've gone way over. Sorry, <laughs> really sorry. Okay, next up is Kathleen. I have lost my intro sheet now. So Kathleen is Kathleen Bel Bonjon. Kathleen is originally from Belgium, but she um, moved from Belgium to um, sunny South Galway 30 years ago and has gone native. And Kathleen um, is going to um, is runs Gort Cycles, Cycle Trails. And Kathleen is going to tell us a bit about now about Bella City and her experience of it. All right, well, hi all. Oh, um, I'm Kathleen. Um, now, the reason that I took this picture is because um, until that day, really, I had never rented uh, a public bike before. Um, as I live out in the west of Ireland, um, we don't have uh, any, any kind of rental buy schemes that are public. So um, I, did, I decided to uh, try it, uh, but I'd never done it before. So that was definitely a new experience for me. Um, and as Damien alluded, it's an absolutely beautiful city. Um, it's kind of this strange feeling of, I don't know, to me it felt, felt, it felt very Italian because uh, there's all these, you know, there, there, these, there's this river and then there's these walks. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, anyway, you can, you can go to the next slide. Um, so here is just a little bit, I guess, about myself. And so I'm in, based in South Galway, um, a place called Gort. Um, that, I don't know how many of you have actually heard about Gort. Um, yes, it has lots of Brazilians, um, but it actually has a lot more to offer. Um, I, um, you see the bike in the back. I, I got that bike through the, the bike to work scheme um, actually five years ago, um, because I had a bike that I had bought in Dublin I lived in Dublin in the very beginning and I cycled a lot in Dublin. Um, but at the time I had bought a second-hand bike of, of one of the rental shops and really 20 years or 25 years later I really needed a new bike. So I, um, I invested in the, in the bike because I started a new job in Galway um, but the, the, it was a, the job was in part more and I had worked there before and I did not like the idea of being stuck in traffic again every day for like probably an hour going an hour back so I cycled the last five kilometers into work and to be honest that was the, the beginning of a new journey I can't say different um I um I started to um tweet that I was cycling these last five kilometers and that's how I kind of got talking uh, to the Galway cycling campaign um, and at the time uh, when I cycled the last five kilometers, I couldn't really park my bike in or my, my car anywhere because while I had thought that I was going to park my car um, in the airport, go to the airport, but actually that was locked. So I, I was campaigning to uh, transform the airport into a bike hub, um, but that never really happened. But anyway, I'm re transgressing here. Um, when I, uh, when the COVID hit, I then could no longer cycle my, my last five kilometers and I really missed it because I really enjoyed it. So I started to cycle around here locally and it's then really that for the first time I actually went to cycle all the roads around here and I, I, I take a bit of pride, I think that I've cycled every road there is in South Galway. Uh, <laughs> because there's many roads, um, but you have to kind of know where they are um, and where it's nice. Uh, and then kind of, as that was progressing, there was the public consultation for the Greenway. Um, and it was, I guess, myself and the shooters that saw that opportunity and we ran a successful six week campaign where in the end, um, we had the highest amount of submissions and Red Route 5 has become the preferential corridor that will connect um, uh, Athlone with Galway. I took a course to become a cycle ride instructor 
And then I also became a member of Cyclosodai on the executive committee, where I work with the finance work group and also I think the communication work group. But um, we always look for new people um, and people switch around. Um, I then set up obviously the Gore Cycle Trails uh, because I really want to map safe cycle trails in South Galway in North Clare. Um, and I'm preparing myself to start giving a cycle training uh, to adults and also community groups. Um, and so that's a picture of me on one of the many dark roads uh, in South Galway. Very, very nice. Okay, next slide. Now about uh, Velocity. All I can say, oh my God, it is one humongously big event with lots of people. Um, and it really is like a professional event where that you have to really decide ahead which, which session you're gonna go to. Uh, it was also for me the first time to actually met fellow members of the cyclists that I group because we all, because of COVID we couldn't meet. So I would have met Damien for the first time at the airport, uh, which is fun. And of course, Joe uh, in Leitrim uh, and then anybody else that was there. Um, but it was really a challenge to decide um, what session to go to. I guess for myself, I have an interest in, obviously in rural cycling. Um, I have a real bugbear with speed limits on rural roads. Like I live in a beautiful area, but the, the Boreens have literally 80 kilometer signs in them, it's mad. Um, I, I'm interested obviously in this whole thing about cycle tourism and greenways um, in the West of Ireland. Uh, also mental health, I know it wasn't really mentioned, but I think it's important. Uh, and they're really finding ways to map safe cycle trails, uh, learn from others uh, and network where it's possible. So it was, there was lots, lots of things to cover and it was difficult to pick, but I, I did settle on a few things, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, so I, um, I'm not really into gaming. Some people like gaming, it's not really my thing, but I, I do this whole thing about virtual reality. And um, I think it's really interesting. Uh, and I think there are use cases of it also in Ireland. Like I cycled, um, uh, it was the Danube and also Budapest. And it was really, it was fantastic. You know, you're, you're, you put this thing on your head and you can see around you. And I mean, I could imagine people that have reduced mobility that, that would like to experience uh, beautiful scenery. And I could, I could see an opportunity in that. Um, and then the, uh, the Eurovela route, obviously it's very near to where I live. It also intersects with the red route. Um, they had a, a competition there that you could win, you could win a folded bike. And I did all the questions for the competition. And I, I really told them that they could reserve the bike for me, but I didn't win it. Unfortunately, I won socks. <laughs> that was that, but it's, the opportunity, I think, in the west of Ireland for uh, slow tourism is real. Um, you know, the, here, for, maybe if not familiar with the whole attraction of, let's say, the Cliffs of Moher, um, it's a big thing, but it's aimed um, at buses, um, buses that pass through the likes of Kinvara and they never stop. So it doesn't benefit the local community and people organize trips from as far as Belfast to Cliffs of Moher in a one day trip. Um, and it doesn't really benefit the local community. So I think the slow tourism uh, is, the, is another way of bringing tourists to the area. Um, and well, they need accommodation, they need food um, and they need fun. So uh, I think, uh, I look forward to see how the, they say the Greenway develops, uh, but Eurovelo 2 will very much, I think, connect or let's say be alongside um, Red, Route, Red Route 5. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I think there's many opportunities um, in that area as well. Um, next slide. You know, that's eight minutes there, Kathleen. Uh, rich, that's rich coming from me after I went to did okay. trials. Anyway, so, but basically, so as I grew up in Belgium, I grew up with this, uh, it's called this Knobkund network. And it's basically a junction 
uh, network providers. You see all these uh, signs um, on the roads and you just follow numbers and the numbers connect to, to the next village or town. Um, and for me, I when I did all the cycling around here, I, I, there was no way of me of knowing any, any of these routes because it's nowhere marked. And I would love to see something like that in the west of Ireland. I believe it's it's there. Uh, and it's just a matter of, you know, as Joe mentioned about the, the crack system, I think um, assessing the routes um, and, and forging ahead and doing it because it's, you know, the, there is the, the national cycling plan, but that's for villages or towns of 5,000 and more. But so many places in the west of Ireland don't have that. So therefore they'd be excluded. Um, so to me, this is the way. And then books I'd recommend you read is Dervla Murphy. Read her, read her books. She's fantastic. I've just finished reading uh, the, the one that she traveled to India. Absolutely fantastic book. You have to read it. Uh, and then definitely the movement book. Um, really the movement book, you should get it for your Christmas or ask someone to get you a book voucher. Because it really, it, it, it debunks a few things that you think, oh, now I understand it. And it's like, no, no, no. You know, it explains how it, came, how it worked in Holland and all the, the challenges they faced and the historic background. I was absolutely fascinated. So anyway, that's my, my talk. <laughs> and next slide, I think, is just my little thank you. So, um, so anyway, if, if ever you're planning to come to the west of Ireland, um, and particularly Gort, let me know. Uh, I can, and I've, I've started to, to document some of the, the cycle routes on the website. It's still very much under uh, work in progress, but uh, definitely worthwhile to have a look at it. Kathleen, thanks a million. That was really interesting. And I said, like, as a person who grew up in rural Ireland myself, I totally agree with you about the speeds on rural roads and how lovely places can be inaccessible because of the traffic on them and you you make all of your making I'm so jealous I didn't get to the city this year <laughs> sounds fabulous <laughs> okay I'll quickly move on to Rebecca Breslin Rebecca Breslin um is involved in in Galway in, in Galway in, in campaign and she's in um works or she's involved in campaigning for the Salt Hill and the um Barna Greenways and she's also involved in the newly set up Sundays for Safety um, group which are trying to are campaigning for 30 kilometers an hour and for also for Salt Hill to be a safe place to cycle. Hand over to you there now Rebecca, thank you. Hi and um, hi everybody and um, it's great to be here. I'm just hoping can you hear me okay and because my connection is coming and going and also am I able to share um, my presentation? I didn't send it on. Um, you're in the wrong thing there. Okay. Um, Is that it? Yeah, we can see that. Brilliant. Thank you. Here we go. And also, Ellen, please uh, let me know about the time because really I'm throwing these slides together in the last uh, today. So uh, give me a shout when I'm the event up, please. Um, so I'll, first, I'll, I'll let you know it's six minutes. This is, oh, you do, okay. please. Because I just put the slides, there's way too much. So <laughs> stop talking. Um, so first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, it was such such a joy today to look back over the pictures and the slides and remember the conference. And um, so huge thanks to Dave and Science Society and the the Dublin Cycling Campaign for facilitating it, uh, allowing me to join the Irish contingent over there, which is amazing, and to be back from the joy here this evening. Um, so I thought at the time I did this conference justice, I showed up at all the talks, we took notes, and I went to the technical tour and the white parade, um, but it was just so, so much to see. It was inspiring uh, to come from places like Galway, where the car is king, and 
to see the energy and the transformations that are possible um, when you get a lot of like minds in a room and in a city. Um, so my caveat at the start is that uh, I'm definitely not going to do content justice. Uh, there are loads of fab presentations and videos online, and there's a link available I can put in the chat afterwards. Um, I'm just going to show other people's slides and ideas, I suppose, in case it resonates with people here or support the ideas you have um, and all that in about four minutes. Uh, so where do I start? I'm going to start in the middle on the Wednesday when we had the bike parade. So I'm just going to share a couple of the short videos just to kind of share a glimpse of the, the energy that was around the place. So hopefully you can hear them. Uh, I might have to cut the second one short. The introduction to the bike And, and I suppose the theme of the conference was fighting the change. I don't know if you could hear the energy there in the, um, the presentation. I hope you could. I'm just going to show briefly then the other video of the bike parade. I think these are just a, such a powerful way of um, bringing people together. Oh, I might not let me play. There we go. They, they shut down the city. Um, on the Wednesday evening and just hundreds of people. I don't know how many it seems like it seems like thousands, but um, everybody got out on their bikes and tried to capture most of the Irish people in this one. Um, and what's so great about the conference is that there was such an equality between people, like there were mayors, uh, national transport league, uh, advocates, um, councillors, everybody was in the room together and everybody was equal. So the picture is not really given it justice here, but it just was a lovely evening to capture some of the energy. So I'll move on. Um, first of all, I suppose, yeah, the welcome was really, was really lovely. Uh, it was a lovely warm welcome when I arrived at the conference in the morning to see this welcome cyclist. Um, as Damien said, the professionalism was just, in, just astounding. Um, and and it was intoxicating, I suppose. Um, I don't know if this is blocked on my screen here, but like when I walked there in the morning, I saw this sign, Push to Reset the World, uh, on one of the sector conferences. And it did feel like there was a change uh, happening. Um, as Damien said, it's when it really invigorates you and gives you an energy to continue on. Struggle, I struggle sometimes advocating the advice. So I suppose just to give you an outline um, of all the different so people ask me what, what's happened to the cycling conference, it was just so much to see. Um, there were presentations on cycling infrastructure, campaigning, transport poverty, um, funding, innovation, engaging citizens. Like they were just my screenshots on my phone. There were just so many different sessions to see. On the first morning, um, Robert Saller, I think he was at Wolf 21 as well, presented on the Pan European Master Plan, which I, I'd never heard of. So, this was uh, something that came up as he described it as kind of they came up with it as a, you know, as a bit of crack or a joke in 2013. And they managed to get you know, 46 ministers in 27 countries to sign up to it. Um, so, it's just a wonderful way to progress cycling and get um, education to the I went to a presentation on education. Educating both courses that are available for um, for sustainable mobility and cycling, and educating the planners or our So there was a presentation from Tom in Westminster, and the Act of Travel Academy over there on linking the research and the activists and the practitioners. So this, this is something that's really important uh, in, in Ireland, and I think. It, would be something that would be great to work on in Galway. Um, there was a presentation from Dr. Angela Franke in Germany, who was a cycling professor over there and one of the first female engineers. And again, to echo what I just said, it was great representation um, for women in all the groups. Um, and she said, as both Tom in London spoke about infusing cycling into everything, and she also highlighted the importance of anchoring cycling in the and adding content to everything. 
circumstances? Should we talk about cycling as about transport or should we talk about about, about life? And this was this theme was kind of echoed throughout the conference, the importance of getting cycling into every single urban plan or policy. That's two minutes there now, Rebecca. Great. And how to <coughs> um, yeah, how to get the data across to to the policymakers and people make the decision. There was a talk about bioeconomics. Again, I thought this was really interesting because um, basically it was saying that, you know, um, the importance of getting across again to people who make the decisions that driving cars takes from society, even if they don't drive, that costs them to crash and congestion pollution, climate change and health, and that everyone is in the park, whereas biking and walking gives, and especially for those who do not spend. So if you have one million euro to spend, you're wondering where to invest it, it's not a cost. You're actually making um, eight euro back for every euro you invest. And uh, we talk about the Sabine handshake, which is collaboration between cities like I think Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and Munich. And St. Correct, St. And it was about collaboration between cities. And I think Dublin are also involved in this. Uh, Dublin were over the other year, and year. And really it's about sharing the learning between cities. And um, you all probably know about that already. There was talk about cycle friendly employers. So there was a presentation from Milan Bergamo. And again, it was about telling stories. So we showed a video of a guy cycling from his home uh, 15 minutes to, to the airport to take a flight to Paris and um, to go to a meeting there. Um, UCD were presenting a bit. They got a gold standard in cycle friendly employer. So it was John Sanders was presenting from Ireland. And it was great to see the Irish contingent. Uh, Connor Garrity was presenting on Facebook. And of course, the Mary. Um, just pictures of some of the Irish contingents. And yeah, just Ljubljana yeah. itself, a fantastic city. There was bikes everywhere. Uh, this picture shows the leaders. There's bikes passed along every road and riders go past. There's little electric vehicles to get around the city centre, which has been successful for maybe 10 years. But yeah. Okay. Oh, is there a um, frozen there? <laughs> so yeah, there were just bikes are part of there every day. Sorry, I hope I wasn't freezing all the way through. Uh, and yeah, that's just a picture of the gallbladder. And of course, Connor and the Mary won for the best piece of infrastructure in Europe like to uh, to the brilliant way of. The, you're breaking up there, Rebecca. And energizing your company. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thanks especially to Jamie. And okay. No problem. <laughs> Time to finish up then. <laughs> Thanks, was Rebecca. It, up all the way through? It was, it was, it, the quality went up and down, but um, it, it, it was okay. It was okay really till the end. It only broke up at the very end. Thanks a million. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think a couple of things really stood out for you there. I was anyway. Yes, it sounds like everyone had a brilliant. It was a brilliant, uplifting time at the conference, and as people got um, and you're thinking about you know, the fact that cycling, the cars cost society, and the cycling and walking actually contributes to society. And we need to get this message through to the decision makers that it's not actually a cost to put in cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure. It's actually you actually reap back, reap back the benefits from it. Um, it's nine o'clock now. So we said that the um, the, the presentation was from eight till nine, but if anyone wants to stay on, we we'll say for 10 minutes to ask any questions, um, far away. So if you want to ask a question, pop up, you know, the little hand, the little hand um, thing, pop up a hand if you want to ask a question and um, we'll get to you if people want to stay on. But obviously don't feel any obligation to stay on, but it's the hour now and Rebecca finished bang on time. <laughs> Thank you. So if anyone has a question, pop up your hand and we'll direct you to whoever you want, it is you want to ask a question to. <clears throat> Any questions? Ready to finish up? Can't see any hands up there. Siobhan? <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to mention that I think there isn't there a call for abstracts for the next Villa City. Um, Damien, did could you say a word or two about that? Yeah, you might have some. Yeah, that's a great reminder, Siobhan. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Velo City in 2023 will happen in Leipzig in in Germany, and the 
the deadline for submitting your abstract, which is a little summary of the, the paper you propose to give, the deadline is the, is the, the last day, the 31st of October. Uh, of, so 31st of this month. Wow. And um, they're generally, it's maybe around a third of a page. It's really a few sentences describing what, what you propose to talk about. It, it could be based on a bit of research. It could be based on a campaign you run. And uh, I'd encourage everyone to, to submit them. It's a good idea. Maybe prepare something, maybe share it with some colleagues to, to, to give it a second pair of eyes. And if you do have an abstract, a lot, I think um, maybe two or three times the number of abstracts that are submitted, um, only, only one third are, are accepted. But it's, it's always a good, I've had plenty of abstracts refused over the years, but it's always a good idea to uh, fire it in and um, give it a shot. Thank you, Damien. That, that deadline is coming up very soon, so it's good for people to know. And again, again nothing ventured, nothing gained. Give it a go. Um, okay, was that, if everyone's happy enough, then I had questions, but of course I've forgotten them now. I didn't write them down. <laughs> That's the only problem with everyone everyone um, speaking and putting questions at the end. Um, so I say thank you to all our speakers for taking taking the time out of your evening um, to talk to us and tell us about Bella City. I think we all want to go now. <laughs> I know I definitely want to go next year. Um, and thank you for all for coming along. It's been great. I said, um, keep an eye on the website. And I said, like I said, there's some great links in the chat there. And if you hit those, the three dots and save, then all those links are saved. You can go back over them later on. And like I said, I'm biased, but I particularly recommend um, having a look at some of the Walk 21 um, presentations. Because like I said, a lot of them were inspiring. And I'm sure the same with Fellow City yesterday, there was some really inspiring and um, thought provoking presentations and interesting presentations that are worth looking back over. Um, okay, so well, I think that's it now. Um, Siobhan, do you want to finish recording and so maybe you can stay on a chat for a few minutes?